With us today are authors Natasha Lester and Kate Thompson. Kate Thompson was born in London and worked as a journalist for women's magazines and national newspapers before she became a novelist. Over the past 10 years, Kate has written 12 fiction and nonfiction titles, three of which made the Sunday Times top 10 bestseller list. She now lives in Sunbury with her husband, two sons, and two rescued lurcher dogs, Ted and Sathy. You can pre-order Kate Thompson's upcoming new book, The Wartime Book Club, which will come out on April 9th. Natasha Lester is the New York Times bestselling author of The Paris Streams, a Seamstress, The Paris Orphan, and The Riviera House, and a former marketing executive for L'Oreal. Her novels have been translated into many different languages and are published all around the world. When she's not writing, she loves collecting vintage fashion, Dior is a favorite, practicing the art of fashion illustration, learning about fashion his history and traveling to Paris. Natasha lives with her husband and three children in Perth, Western Australia. As I was preparing for today, I did come across this review by Carrie Maher, author of The Paris Bookseller. Quote, this book is brave, bold, and beautiful, like the three women who narrate it. Natasha Lester's sentences blaze off the page, and I couldn't stop reading. Full of heart and fierce social critique, the disappearance of Astrid Ricard is an inspiring story of female vision and grit in the face of insurmountable odds. I absolutely loved it. Remember, we will have time for Q&A. Let's enjoy the discussion together. R.J. Julia, Wesley and R.J. Julia and Bookhampton are so grateful to have Natasha Lester and Kate Thompson here in conversation today. I'm going to let them get started. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Julia, you. for that really lovely introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. I am Kate. Um, so I interviewed you, Natasha, last summer, wasn't it, for my podcast from the Library with Love. And I was so struck by your your passion and your knowledge and your skill at finding history's forgotten women and drawing them from the shadows. And Natasha, I know like you, like me, believe that there's this plethora of extraordinary and often overlooked women whose achievements deserve to be celebrated. And so I want to start, if I may, actually, with, with the dedication, which is an unusual place to start with questions. But for me, it really encapsulates the book and, and felt like a good sort of jumping off point. So you actually wrote, for every woman who's ever had a man, make her into someone less than she truly is. And I was really um, drawn up short, I suppose, by that, that dedication. It's very powerful. Can you share the story behind that? Yes, it was really just, you know, as we, I think, talked about when we were doing the podcast interview, I feel like it's a sad fact in some ways that I feel like there are enough stories out there for me to be able to keep writing historical fiction for the next hundred years, because there are so many women who have been overlooked by history, but I mean, it's kind of good in a way that I'll never run out of ideas, but yeah. it's so terrible yeah. that there are all of these women that I could continue writing about. And what really clinched that dedication for me was there just seemed to be this rush of activity in the media around women like Taylor Swift, who's one of the biggest selling female artists of all time, mm -hmm. a hugely successful woman in her field, and in fact, a hugely successful woman in any field. And yet in every headline about Taylor Swift, it's about who she's dating or a, a picture of her with a completely flat stomach and an arrow pointing to it saying, oh, is she pregnant? And <laughs> they just were such reductive headlines and very cruel in a way at, at how insidious the cultural minimization of amazing women is and how we all accept it and how so many of us kind of just click on those headlines because, oh, yeah. it's something about Taylor Swift without realising that we're kind of telling the media, oh, we want more of this stuff because that's what we do when we click on something. And I thought this is how we perpetuate these kinds of stories in the media. What would it be like to write about that? And what would it be like to be the woman on the receiving end of that? And even if you're not the woman on the receiving end of a headline, how many women have experienced that kind of minimization in the workplace, even in their family lives um, amongst other social Everyone's circles. Nodding. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, that was where that dedication came from. It literally came from a place of rage, I think. Yeah. And I just packed it out and thought that but is But I really what... like that you started like that because you could feel the, the passion bristling off the page. It's And it's kind of unusual as a starting point. So I think it's it sets the tone really nicely. Yeah, I feel like this is the one book where... I really poured out everything I was thinking into it. And I feel like maybe that's why I feel so strongly connected to the story here because I didn't hold back often. You do as a writer because you think, oh, readers might um, be confronted by all that kind of passion and rage and um, that I'm pouring into all these words. But this time I thought, no, you know what? I feel like this is the right moment for this then, you know, Britney Spears' memoir came out and it kind of talks about a lot of the stuff that is going on in this book as well. And I thought, no, this is the right time for this book. Do you know what? It's so interesting that you say that because I really, and I'm deviating slightly off my questions here, but I really noticed <laughs> that actually because it felt almost like a manifesto. I yeah. could really tell that you had changed a gear almost somehow and there was this sort of almost like this outpouring that came from you. So it was really interesting to see, to hear that story behind the, the dedication because I, I sensed that straight away. Um, but you also said that the Battle of Versailles was the first thing to inspire you to write The Disappearance of Astra Picard. Can you share the story about that with us? Yes, I can. So I had never heard of the Battle of Versailles, which is not a, a battle that takes place with guns and swords. It's <laughs> no, it's not a physical. Takes, no, <laughs> it's a battle that takes place with gowns and couture um, in the gracious halls of the Palace of Versailles. Um, and as soon as I read about it, I thought this is the most spectacular backdrop for a novel and I have to find a way to write a story around it. So in a nutshell, you know, a lot of people have visited the Palace of Versailles and it's this resplendent, glorious, amazing building. But in the 1970s, it was falling apart and it required, um, you know, millions of dollars worth of renovation and restoration. And there was no money to do that. So the caretaker at the time came up with this idea to host this fashion extravaganza, which would be a battle between five French couturiers and five American fashion designers for the title of fashion capital of the world. And I just thought I loved that idea so much. And then when I began reading about the event, it had all of the elements that you look for as a novelist. It had drama, it had conflict, it had big personality, it had ego. Um, So we have our teams that are selected. And of course, the five French are all men, people like Dior and Yves Saint Laurent, um, Marc Bowen for Dior. Sorry, I should clarify that. And then on the American side, the first four designers chosen were again all men, Bill Blass, Oscar de la Renta, Stephen Burroughs and Halston. And then the fifth person they chose was also a man, but he actually declined because um, he had a thriving kind of uh, business out of Hollywood and he didn't want to spend the money to go to Paris and present his gowns. So then they asked Jeffrey Bean, who had his nose put out of joint because he was the second reserve. So he said no as well. So then they were like, oh, God, who are we going to ask? And so we've got nine men out of our 10 designers. And they finally stumbled upon a woman. <laughs> as if, You know, it was a really difficult oh, thing to find a woman working in fashion at the time. So they picked Anne Klein, who was quite revolutionary in terms of um, introducing separates to uh, the, the fashion world. So everyone went to Versailles. And it was this horrific kind of backstage scenario where it was absolutely freezing. It was November and there was no heating and there was no water and there was no toilet paper. And everyone was walking around in scarves and coats and mittens and hats and all the paraphernalia and trying to sew their dresses and finish everything off at the same time. And the French had spent, you know, five times the amount the Americans had spent. The Americans' backdrop had been measured in feet instead of meters and it was too short and they couldn't use it they had a mixtape to play music behind their segments of the show the French had this full-blown orchestra so the (laughs) Americans are thinking oh my god we are so stuffed we're gonna lose Um, but because they had these incredible um, black models people like um, you know all these amazing women um, who they brought with them um, people like Beth Ann Hardison um, etc And they got onto the stage and they danced to this mixtape, which was all full of all the songs of the time. They had these beautiful gowns that were fluid and had movement like Stephen Burroughs, beautiful lettuce hemmed dresses. 
And it was this amazing spectacle compared to the French half of the show, which was very stiff and went on for hours. And so, yeah. in fact, Americans won. And it was this oh, very did, yeah, unusual victory that no one was kind of expecting. But then afterwards, nobody really wrote about it in the press and celebrated the victory. And I think that was because of a lot of the backstage um, sort of conflicts involving particularly Halston, who had a very big ego and would refer to himself in the third person. He'd call himself Halston rather than saying, you know, I, he'd say Halston. Um, and a lot of that was directed against Anne Klein, who suffered terribly backstage as the only woman. So whilst it had this kind of very glitzy, fabulous narrative of the underdog mm -hmm. taking on the and winning, there was also this storyline about women fighting against misogyny and prejudice and being belittled and shunned and shunned and pushed aside that I wanted to bring out as well. Yeah, well, you did it so well. And I think you really kind of juxtaposed that high glamour with that kind of bubbling underbelly of all the tension that must have been going on behind the scenes. It's a fascinating little part of history that really, isn't it? Has it been written about in many other novels that you know of? I, I don't know of any other novels that feature the Battle of Versailles. And it was really Robin Gavan who wrote this amazing nonfiction account of the event. That was my biggest source um, of material because there's no video footage whatsoever of the event. Um, and there are just a few okay. still photographs that exist. So in wow. terms of finding original source material, there's very little out there, but her account is, you know, um, a majestic account of the event. So thank you you a lot Thank to Robin for yeah. writing such an incredible now you know non fiction now good non-fiction about the event mm. I couldn't have done that's, it without her <laughs> no, and that's absolute you know gold mine isn't it for, for authors yeah. I mean can you imagine if that took place today you know the amount of social media and live streaming and you oh, know yeah. the hashtags and nothing no minute would go undocumented but the fact that such it's a huge uh, event in fashion history could happen with relatively little fanfare is quite unusual isn't it yeah, it's so unusual. And I was reading um, Bill Blass's memoir as part of my research. And in that memoir, he says, um, you know, it was an event that should have gone down in history, but mm. we were all so terrible to one another that I think that's why um, some people just wanted to forget afterwards. And yeah. he was writing that sort of 20 years post the event. And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting reflection on how that something is, that could be a victory was actually seen as a bit of a defeat because yeah. they all recognized that feeling in their gut of we behaved badly. Wow. We could have done wow. That. A clash of egos for sure. Yeah. So let's let's move on to Misa Bricard, who is an enigma, isn't she? And a, and a legend and a much maligned woman. Can you tell us about her and how much you were motivated to kind of almost write this like revisionist history of, of her? So I began with this idea of wanting to write about Mitzvah Bricard that I'd had in my head for quite a number of years. And because she, in every book I'd read about Dior, and I'd obviously read quite a lot for research on other novels, she is there as this mysterious figure who is always called Christian Dior's muse. And a lot of those, they're all nonfiction accounts, so they're all meant to be true, Almost every single one of those nonfiction accounts says that Mitza liked to uh, swan into the house of Dior wearing just a leopard print coat and nothing at all underneath. She never liked wearing underwear. She had this amazing jewellery collection that was furnished by all of her lovers, everyone from the Aga Khan to a Turkish prince, etc. And she lived at the Ritz and never woke up until afternoon and lived on champagne. And, you know, she was presented as being this, you know, very scandalous uh, kind of sensual woman. And I wanted to write about her because that was all there was about her. The rest of it was kind of, it was like a couple of books said she just emerged from nowhere. And of course, as novelists, mm -hmm. we love the people who emerge from nowhere because it's like, well, how did that happen? How did she come from nowhere yeah. to being Kristen Dior's, you know, muse? And then when I began to research her, I found very quickly, and it wasn't very difficult to find, a lot of information that seemed to suggest she was so much more than Christian Dior's muse. And when I found that information, which suggested she was a, an incredibly talented fashion designer in her own right, it made me quite angry because I thought, how do these nonfiction writers who have access to faster resources than I do as an individual kind of, you know, researching fiction, 
overlook these very important documents on the historical record that mm. show as a quote for example from an obituary written about Mitzi that she was a greater designer than Coco Chanel I mean that's a big call you know if you're going to think of who are the greatest female fashion designers from history or even the greatest fashion designers full stop Coco Chanel is going to be a name that rises to the top and here is an obituary about Mitzi saying she was possibly greater than Chanel yeah. and it made me start to re rethink all of those creative partnerships between men and women where men are always cast into the role of creator and the women working alongside them are always cast into the role of muse. And I'm thinking of people like, you know, Camille Claudel, Rodin's lover, who is also called his muse, where she was an amazing sculptor in her own right. Dora Ma, who worked alongside Picasso, again, always called his muse. She was an amazing artist in her own right as well. So I just began to, again, get that bit of a sense of rage up on Mitz's behalf because really um, there was one article that I read that really clinched it for me and it was an article, in fact, written and published in, in an Australian newspaper in 1950 and the headline reads, Dior's assistant, a woman of chic. And it goes on to describe how behind every single Dior garment that is produced out of the house of Christian Dior, Mitza Bricard is the incredibly important figure because she's Christian Dior's first assistant designer. Now, a first assistant designer is a very different thing to being someone's muse. A muse is kind of someone who does is a very passive role, whereas a first assistant designer is someone who is actually in the workroom making the gowns and it's amazing how reading those things makes you re-look at things you have previously read in a new light there's one paragraph in Christian Dior's memoir that he wrote and he talks about Mitza walking into the um into the atelier and there's a mannequin standing there with one of his gowns on and Mitza shortens the sleeve changes the neckline puts a belt around the dress, refashions the hem, and he says, and voila, I have a new dress. And only looking back at that description do I think, oh, my gosh, he is describing the process of Mitzah Bricard taking something that he had put on a mannequin and refashioning the whole thing and creating an entirely new gown out of one of his designs. Mm -hmm. And he says in there how much better the gown was. But it's so easy to overlook that when you think yeah. Mitzer is only the muse. So it was a really interesting research process. And for me, it was probably the first time where I felt like I was doing new research, research that hadn't been done before and presenting facts about a person that had previously never found the light of day. So it was really exciting, actually. To yeah, be I bet. To I bet. Show Mitza for who she really was rather than who she had been made into by history. And I, I find this so fascinating because almost in a sense you're approaching it with a kind of journalistic um, attitude. And so when... At what point did it begin to dawn on you, look, this woman has been, you know, hugely reduced in her status to just that of Muse. When did you begin to unpick these details and begin to see a bigger picture, as it were? So it was two things. And, and one of the things is it makes me laugh to look back on it because it's only someone who is quite obsessed with Dior that might have noticed <laughs> this. Um, I was just reading this article um, which had been written by Professor Lourdes Font who's a, a professor of fashion design at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York and it was just a bit of for me I, I thought it was just a bit of background um, and but in that article she talks about how uh, Mitza Ricard was working at Molyneux in 1938 and I had never known that Mitza had worked for Molyneux who was another fashion designer in Paris particularly during the 1930s and how she had decorated all of his gowns in the spring 1938 collection with Lily of the Valley Flowers. And again, like most people just skim mm. over that sentence and go, okay, that's a relatively unimportant fact. But it was like a light bulb went off in my head because the House of Dior has these codes or these uh, motifs that re reappear in all of their designs every season. And one of those codes is Lily of the Valley Flowers. Mm. And everybody says it's a code of the House of Dior because he grew up surrounded by flowers. And so he wanted to use Lily of the Valley as a, as a House of Dior motif. But I thought, okay, well, here is Mitza using Lily of the Valley in 1938. So nine years before the House of Dior even existed, 
What if it was Mitza who introduced Lily of the Valley to Dior rather than it being because he grew up surrounded by flowers? And that was the thing that made me go and do a deep dive into databases and made me discover the second thing, which um, which then just uh, kind of blew the lid off everything, I guess. And the second thing was a shipping record of all things. I spent hours on Ancestry.com, which a lot of people use for family tree research. Yeah, yeah. Um, Great for fiction writers. And I found a record of Mitza traveling as a 24 year old woman from Paris to New York. And now, most 24 year old women in 1924 never left the village they were born sure. in, alone Much traveled from Paris to New York. I thought, what was she doing? And shipping records are great. They have all of this extra info. And you've got to write where is the address you're going to be spending most of your time. And she'd written the Harry Angelo Company in New York. So, of course, I then have to go and find out what, what the hell is the Harry Angelo Company. And I discover he's a big garment manufacturer. At that time, Paris couturiers aren't selling their fashions directly in New York. They send a, their most trusted representative over to New York once or twice a year to show their um, couture designs. The garment manufacturer purchases the right to make those designs up for their Manhattan and, and American customers. And so the only reason why Mitza could have been traveling in 1924 to visit Harry Angelo would be because she was the trusted representative of the French nice. couturier who was right. showing these designs to Harry Angelo. But well, that's a massive responsibility for a 24 year old yeah. woman. She was amazing. And so that was what crystallized it for me. I have to just go yeah. and find everything uh, I possibly can about this woman. Um, so it was utterly fascinating to, you know, see what she was and to imagine her, you know, standing on yeah. the rail of a ship as a 24 year old going, oh, wow, I'm going to New York to show these designs. How amazing am I? You know, that would be yeah. incredible. But you know what, Natasha, I think how, how amazing are you, though, because you've taken something that a woman who's been um, reduced in all ways by history and you've used a kind of journalist eye, but then you've also applied a huge amount of empathy to the to her life to produce this kind of reimagining of her, which so, you could so easily, I suppose, ha have written as a nonfiction, couldn't you? Because you had all the details in the research. Um, yeah, so it's, it's an I extraordinary book. Yeah, oh, thank you. I do feel like there is a nonfiction book about Mitza that someone needs to write one day. Um, for sure. I don't know whether for sure. I um, have the skills for that, but she she deserves one. I think you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's move on to another of the book's central themes, which which very clearly to me, or, or at least I picked up on quite quickly, was that of misogyny and that sense of women just sort of endlessly fighting against men, against violence, against war, and the scenes particularly against so-called collaborators. So the women that were condemned after the liberation of Paris, I found particularly hard to read. Um, this line in particular, would she be questioned, arrested, beaten, shaved, shunned? And it really, I felt that sort of combination of just despair and anger and and, and uncomfortable as well. And then it got me thinking, why is it important for us to feel uncomfortable reading fiction? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so there's a short part of the book that is set sort of in those post-war years. And mm. I've read a lot about um, what happened to women at that time. And of course, a lot of people have seen images of Les Femmes Tendues, which were the women who had their heads shaved and were paraded That's through the street as collaborators and that's how we see them we think okay these are the women who worked with the nazis these were the evil women the terrible women but actually if you go and do a bit of digging again not that much it doesn't take that much effort <laughs> you find all of these very harrowing accounts of a lot of men suddenly joining the french resistance in those last couple of weeks of the war men who had been nazi collaborators but mm -hmm. who suddenly realized the tide was turning and they all they had to do was walk around the streets saying that they were part of the resistance and brandishing a gun and they were excused from all of the things that they had done during the war. But yet a woman who had to feed her grandparents, her aunts, her uncles, her brother, her sisters, her her children, you know, she might have had 20 people to feed because there were no men left in France. They had all been taken prisoner of war at the start of the war or they had gone to join the resistance or they were, you know, they were missing, they'd vanished. And so when you've got 20 people relying on you for food, 
sometimes you have to do things that you may not necessarily want to do in order to be able to mm-hmm. keep those 20 people alive. And, you know, some of those were very minor things that just involved trade-offs for bread. Um, but yet those were the things that the women were paraded through the streets for and called collaborators for when you had a lot of men, particularly in business environments, doing much vaster levels of of treachery in terms of the way they dealt with the Nazis who got off scot-free. And there was one book I read that said that people needed an outlet for their rage afterwards, this shame that they felt as Parisians to have kind of let the Nazis come in and take over their country had to be expunged somehow. And here were the women. And that was how got rid yeah. of their rage and their shame by pelting the and women they were an outlet for that rage weren't they exactly and I thought oh gosh again here is this other story of how there's an, a totally alternate narrative um and it could it should have been probably some of those men being marched through the streets but they never were and it was the women who were the outlet for that shame which yeah. you know we replicated now in the media where the women are the outlet of rage and shame when it comes to articles and reporting we're not throwing rocks at them but we're throwing words at them and they hurt just as much yeah no you're absolutely right and that kind of I I think there's something so visceral and kind of awful about you know shaving a woman's hair off you know decrying her so publicly and I think for anybody you and I talked about this on the podcast didn't we last summer but anybody interested in in kind of exploring that or understanding more, Lee Miller, the American photographer, published some brilliant photographs of that, didn't she, of women in um, so-called, co- you know, horizontal collaborators being shaved in the streets. That are really harrowing to, yeah. to look at. But it's such um, an important document of what actually happened. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So let's, on that sort of subject of gender bias, how do you feel fiction can play a part in challenging and confronting that in the way that you did with the collaborators? But what, why, how does fiction um, confront those aspects that we, you know, that, that, that I suppose we can't in everyday life? I think fiction enables us to appreciate the human element of what happened in history. I mean, sort of a non-fiction account will tell you the facts of an event but for me so I could you know as a non-fiction writer you could easily write about okay this is the date where for example the women started to be paraded through the streets and this is how many were involved and this is what happened to some of them but from a fiction writer's point of view it's like how did that woman feel when she was walking through the street and how did the spectators on the sidelines feel when they saw them not all of those spectators felt the same not all of them had the rage some of them were other women who empathized perhaps with the women walking past or who felt relieved that it was that woman and not them when it could perhaps have so easily have been them and it's unpicking all of those complexities and how we think about an event that fiction does so well and I always say that you know particularly with historical fiction you know in some ways it shows us how far we've come we probably wouldn't you would hope in somewhere like France parade women through the streets and throw stones at them today and shave their heads but that's still happening in other parts of the world so therefore it also shows us how far we still have to go because as I said before we may not be perpetrating those kind of physical acts of violence against women for acts that we deem to be unwomanly but there are still plenty of other ways in which women are judged for things that are are deemed to be kind of unwomanly in society so there's still a lot of movement Mm. so I like historical fiction for that reason that it shows us where we've traveled from but where we still need to get to yeah and and I suppose allows us to emotionally connect as well doesn't it I mean learning about the past through through non-fiction we can understand and we can learn but learning about it through historical fiction we can lean in and we can walk side by side with that person and, and emotionally connect for me I think that's why I continue and you know return to it time and again it's that emotional connection to the past and characters that enables us to learn in, yeah. a, in another way absolutely and you always hear people say that you know fiction is what teaches us empathy and I t- absolutely agree with that oh. um it's yeah. perfect for that yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think I think most of my empathy growing up was as a child was through the reading of books that I took out from yeah. the library. I think that's where yes, you know, you, 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 well, you know, you and I have talked about this, but it's yes. where we explore that interior world and put ourselves into the shoes of of others and and develop that strong sense of empathy. So, Natasha, one of the things that I I loved this novel so much, but one of the things I kept that that I had to keep 
stopping and thinking, making myself think, well, wow, this was such a kind of ambitious novel, you know, executed with such grace and confidence. And I was so full of awe that you tackled not two, but three timelines. And, you know, the reader in me loved it, but the author in me was thinking, wow, this is so much work. <laughs> that is so <laughs> much research. And it felt very reminiscent to me of those big blockbuster reads that Jackie Collins and, and Penny Vincenzi wrote so successfully. Did you have a sense that you were pushing yourself out of your comfort zone almost and, and flexing new creative muscles? Or was it just like, do you know what? I'd love to do this. And oh God, I've bitten off more than I could chew. How did, what was the sort of thought process around it? Oh gosh, you're very kind and very lovely to say that. But yes, uh, there were many, many, many times. You just have to ask my editor where I said, I actually just can't do this. I have, I'm not a skilled enough writer to be able to do what I thought that I could do. And I suppose, you know, for me, not being a, a someone who plans or plots a novel in advance, I didn't really know what I was doing up front. I didn't really understand really? Wow. what I was doing. Three timelines and, and four different points of view. And I, I didn't grasp that properly um and really unusually for me this time I actually started with the contemporary storyline I always start writing the historical storylines first and then do the contemporary last but this time because I felt so out of my depth with suddenly writing about the 1970s for the first time and then I was still doing the re research about Mitza so I didn't feel like I could start writing her yet Whereas the contemporary setting actually has a little bit of a, a personal connection. So I started there because I felt most comfortable because it takes place in this French chateau where the main character Blythe has come for a kind of a family reunion with all of her ex-in-laws. And um, my father-in-law um, loves a bit of a grand gesture, I always say, and put all of his big birthday <laughs> takes his extended family away somewhere. So in 2018, for his 80th, he took 29 people to stay in a chateau in the Loire oh, really? Valley in France, which is exactly where Blythe oh, finds yes. herself. And it was as hilarious as Blythe's experience <laughs> because we joke that the chateau owners were sitting in the window watching the bus drive up and only then did they turn the heaters on. And it was December <laughs> and it was minus five degrees and we were all oh very gosh. cold and we're all from Australia. So we're not, we don't cope with the cold. And we walked into the chateau expecting to feel the blast of central heating. And it was like this blast of air that was colder inside than it was outside. <laughs> we were all just looking at each other like oh well maybe in an hour it'll kind of warm up but of course it's this massive drafty French chateau it took the whole week to warm up so we spent our whole time inside in our coats in our beanies in our mittens in our scarves in our snow yeah. boots you know braced against the chill and it was just very funny there's a, a woman in the contemporary storyline the chateau owner who walks around in these shaggy boots and coats and with his nickname the yeti and that was our chateau host basically and I just was thinking to myself god this may, would make such a great backdrop for a book um, but again being a, a novelist we want to make things as difficult as possible for our protagonist so I thought well how could you make this even worse and I thought well what if it wasn't your actual family-in-law but it was your ex-family-in-law that would be terrible <laughs> so that's the situation such a novelist. I, I love that I know I know <laughs> Terrible, isn't it? So that's the situation I plunged Blythe into. And that's why I began writing that contemporary storyline first, because like I know this chateau, I know how it felt, I can write this. Um yeah, yeah. so that gave me the confidence to get started. But during the edit, trying to I tried so many different ways to alternate between the different storylines before I settled on the kind of Astrid Blythe alternation, kind of bookended by bits of Mitza. Um that and it, and when I stumbled upon it, I was like, of course, this is the right way. But it's a lot of trial and error, a lot of rewriting, and I yeah, wouldn't recommend yeah. anyone sit down and try a, a triple narrative anytime yeah. soon. Yeah, I just all I was just thinking is, how did she dovetail this together? Like it, it just gave me a headache thinking about it. But it but it read flawlessly and it flowed beautifully. So well done for sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to ask the next question: Is how long did it take you to research and write? Uh, the research was quite long. I tend to write a first draft um, before I've done a lot of research because, again, not being a plotter or a planner, I don't really know where my research scope is until I've written a draft. Like I knew, obviously, I had to research the Battle of Versailles, that I had to research Mitz's past Um but I didn't really know what else I needed to research within that 1970s framework. And it wasn't until 
I started um, writing that and reading these accounts of what happened to Anne Klein, who I mentioned before, that I realized, okay, I need to dig a bit more deeply into what happened to female fashion designers in the mm-hmm. 1970s. And I found John Ch- Fairchild, the Women's Wear Daily head, who was terrible to a lot of people, mainly women, but not exclusively women. And so it's only when I start writing into those scenes that I realize what I then need to go and research. So that kind of first draft acts as a bit of a research blueprint, yeah. I always say. And I then go and research to fill in and uh, uh, add in all of the extra information I need to understand the era properly or the people or the sort of texture or the worldviews of the time as well. Because obviously the 70s, people's worldviews were quite different to our worldviews oh, now. Yeah. Like business worldviews. So, so the research is kind of an ongoing process while I'm writing. And it's, a, it's about two and a half years of writing and researching and editing all up. But I'm constantly researching through that whole process. I don't, I know some writers kind of do six months of research and then sit down to write. That's not me. It's like I sit down and start writing and I'm doing a bit of research and then I do a kind of a bulk research month after the first draft. And then I continue to do that research as I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. So yeah, it's a very um, good process. And I remember you telling me that when when we spoke last and I was really struck by that because I think it's actually quite, and I'm going to kind of take on board that because I, I'm a little bit the opposite. I tend to get stuck on research yeah. and it's a great yeah. tool for procrastination as well. I yeah. think if you don't let, don't be a slave to the research, you let the story be the king or the queen and then you do the research around it. It's going to, I think definitely I'm going to try that because I can see how you're not going to continually get tripped up and then be tempted to put in loads of research and sort of do that information dump that that can occur when you've spent so much time in an archive or whatever. Yeah. Well, I don't think you're ever in any danger of doing an info dump (laughs) in any of because you're such a glorious fiction writer, but I always feel like hopefully it makes the story come first and the research is just kind of this invisible thing happening underneath that that the reader can feel but never feels overwhelmed by yeah and then it has a lighter touch throughout yeah. throughout the book um one of the other things that I really began to notice was this into sort of the first sort of intergenerational book about the ripple effects of trauma it, mm-hmm. it felt it's a very big subject to tackle was there a reason why you decided to do that now with the book or did it just feel like it lent itself to to the narrative it just kind of happened as I was writing and that often happens to me. It's really interesting. I find doing things like these interviews or or reading a review of your book and people mention something and you think, oh, did I do that? And (laughs) you can relate to that. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think, yeah, okay, yes, I was doing that, but sometimes a lot of those things are more instinctive than deliberate. Um, Like I definitely wanted to look at intergenerational trauma of um, having a parent or a grandparent who was dubbed the muse and what kind of burden the media would place on you for that. But I hadn't really looked more deeply at it than that, um, it, consciously, I guess. But I think a lot of that came out. Um, yeah. Uh, so it was really, and the intergenerational trauma of, um, you know, being abandoned as a child by mother or being put up for adoption and, and those mm. sorts of things which I think you know have quite intense repercussions for for people um and mother-daughter relationships I'm always quite fascinated with those I've got a couple of daughters myself so um, I don't know whether writing sometimes a bit of therapy for me or I don't know (laughs) Um, but I'm always interested in uh events that have become come to have greater significance than they seem to at that point in time but Uh, ripple on for years and years and I think that we all have those in our lives and it's only when we look back on them that we think oh that changed so many lives but we never knew it at the time yeah that's and it's so interesting to hear you say that sorry I've got a little (laughs) hello (laughs) crasher here (laughs) quiet now it's so interesting to hear you say about subliminal um kind of themes coming out in your book that you're not consciously aware of I definitely did that with the wartime library talking about the notion of lots of reviewers said oh you you mentioned a lot of found family and that wasn't something that I particularly noticed (laughs) but definitely just (laughs) very oh no you're fine I I do think it's really fascinating um sorry about that like it's the only time I like reading reviews when they 
point out to you things that you didn't quite know you had done. You think, oh, yeah, actually, I did do that. And you kind of go, yes. oh, pat on the back for, you know, not <laughs> consciously doing that, but having done it anyway. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's that's a wonderful thing about novel writing, isn't it? That you can research and you can come up with solid themes and you know in your head what you're going to explore. But there's always that wonderful bubble of the unknown yes. that sometimes surfaces and just causes deep <laughs> without you even realising. And I think that's where the magic of writing a novel c- can come in and often does. Yes, um, absolutely. And I've got to uh, ask another thing that I know is is almost like your trademark, is a very strong visceral element that weaves its way through your writing. And I loved this passage in particular. You wrote, the salon was lit only by a few lamps. The brocade wallpapers were burgundy and gold and curtains draped seductively in uncustomary places, beckoning you into their folds. All around, women smoked cigarettes. They drank. Many of them, like Ida, wore garments that were more like costumes, gauzy, unexpected. And it really pulled me into that whole scene. I could smell the smoke and the perfume and it was so evocative and sensual. Do you consciously write that way or is that just your the way that you like to read perhaps? Um, it's really interesting. I always say that I love a good adjective or a good simile. <laughs> Me and... too, for sure. <laughs> Maybe too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Same. And I think that um, I, I would say that some readers probably don't enjoy reading a lot of adjectives and those readers probably don't love my books, but readers who do like that sort of uh, richer kind of pro style probably hopefully do relate to some of that so I, I think it's a lot of it, just inherent style choice and you know I remember reading um, you know Amor Toll's Rules of Civility which is his kind of book before his big A Gentleman in Moscow and it's so full of these fantastic similes and like I say I love a good simile and I just reveled in how wild and abandoned he was with his use of them and he just you know flung them out here there and everywhere and I was like so great <laughs> whereas I then read reviews that's you know talk about oh, it's too much and I think well no it's not I loved it so but again that's where we come at from re- different readers and different styles and different likes and different dislikes so I feel like I'm naturally drawn to writers who write like that and whatever you're naturally drawn to as a reader tends to influence how you write. Um, I remember from doing teaching that a lot of people were afraid to read while they were writing because they were afraid it would somehow influence their own writing. But I would always say, well, you know, if you're reading great books, why would you be afraid to be influenced by these amazing prose stylists or these amazing writers? Surely that's a good thing that what you're reading is making you a better writer and so never stop reading because you always want to be the best possible writer fill yourself always with beautiful words and beautiful sentences and amazing prose and hopefully some of that will come out in your own so so yes I it's something I I I love and I just kind of wallow in and when I'm writing I'm always seeing like I remember that scene you know Ida Rubinstein who um, whose salon it is, was a, a Russian ballerina who lived in Paris and she was um, sort of on the avant-garde uh, fringe of Parisian artistic society and I could just see what her room would have looked like and how it would have felt to someone like Mitza who had gone to a convent school and then somehow ended up living with Ida. Um, so I was looking at it through Mitza's perspective of this exotic place that was unlike the mm. convent school where she had been kind of raised. That's so interesting. And that's also really good advice, I think, for anyone that's that's perhaps watching that wants to or is a, is is thinking about writing because the whole concept of reading whilst you're writing, I absolutely agree with that. I absorb and, and I have to read because I think it encourages you, A, to raise your game, but also to look out for narrative devices and sentences that stop you in their tracks that really yes. work for you as a reader. Like what made me love that passage? What did I love about that book? What's the standout line to me? And I try to think about that as I'm writing and let it infiltrate my work. Um, another question I have to ask, and I I really love this, but it was from the from the fashion world to the underworld. So maybe I'm a little <laughs> morbid, <laughs> but for me, the most compelling chapters were those that were based around the underground tunnels of the catacombs of Paris. And I think you read that six million skeletons, skeletons are buried in the snaking tunnels under the streets of Paris. And I really, because and I've been to those catacombs, so I knew I could picture it in my mind's eye immediately. And when you wrote that the bones set into the walls with this strange but beautiful tapestry, 
I love that because that's exactly the way that I felt when I visited. It's a, it's an extraordinary place, isn't it? Did you feature it because you'd visited it and it and it kind of stuck in your mind, or how how why did you decide to weave that in? Oh, I had been long fascinated with the catacombs, and I hadn't visited them when I decided I would use it in the story, but it had just popped up here and there in books that I had read about uh, France during the Second World War with speculation that it was used by the resistance. And in fact, it was where they kind of planned the um, battle for Paris in August 1944. But I I liked the idea that, I mean, it's basically the catacombs and the tunnels underneath Paris are the same size as the city of Paris above because that's where they mined out all the limestone. And it's like this, you can picture it. Here's the ground and here's Paris going up this way. But then underneath, there's this other underground city that penetrates down into the earth to the same extent that the city above does. And I don't know, again, it's just one of those images that as a novelist, you just go, you get chills and go, wow, that's incredible. And so when I was writing Mitza um, and, you know, I was speculating about what she did during the war, it just seemed natural to pull in these catacombs that I'd long had in my head as something I wanted to write about. But I knew I had to go and, and stand in them in order to be able to write about them authentically. So then I did go and visit them. And it sounds creepy to be in a place where, So they exhumed the bones from the cemeteries that were kind of overflowing into the city of Paris and they put them underground in these tunnels that had been dug for the limestone and and made these ossuaries with them. But the workers who did that did it so beautifully and with so much care and they made rotundas and columns and, you know, tapestried the walls with bones in patterns and it's, it feels like an act of love for these mm. unnamed and unknown mm. remains of pe- pe- people who were once, you know, human beings. Um, and so it's not a creepy place at all. It's actually a really beautiful and moving experience. Yeah. And they put these plaques here and there with lines of poetry and uh, proverbs and uh, reflections on mortality and life. And I actually found that this really peaceful meditative I guess it's you know in some ways maybe it's like how some people might experience church um underground there you feel an immense sense of what it means to be a, to be human um so it was a a very moving experience and one I really enjoyed writing about um in Mitzah's sections and one where I fully let myself at my adjectival mind <laughs> loose on the description of the adjectives. Absolutely. So I well, if any, if anyone, and <laughs> I'm going to just quick it, hop in with the last question, because I think this lends itself quite well. Can writing help us see beauty in dark places? Absolutely. I think so. And I, I mean, Sometimes it feels frivolous to be writing, you know, stories when there are so many terrible things going on in the world, particularly over this last year, which for a lot of people has been a shocking year. But I hope that, you know, sometimes we just need to sit down and recharge ourselves for the next fight ahead. And I hope that's where maybe books can come in to give people that sense of the greater world and that there is a greater humanity out there that we we can tap into at these times and maybe fiction gives us a way back to remembering that when it all seems a bit hopeless sometimes. That's a really beautiful answer. Natasha, thank you so much for just an extraordinary, creative and ambitious, bold and beautiful book. I It really did knock my socks off. Um, and I know we filled that time so quickly and I'm sure that we have lots of questions. <laughs> so I'll hand back. <laughs> thank you both. Thank you, Kate and Natasha. What a wonderful conversation and to be a part of it tonight. We do have some questions, so I'll dive right into them. Did you come up with Astrid Bricard's book while writing The Three Lives of Alex St. Pierre? Um, That's an interesting question. I was thinking about what I would write next, but I didn't. So Alex St. Pierre features as a character in The Disappearance of Astrid Bricard. And in fact, she's Astrid's godmother. Did I know that Alex was going to make an appearance in the next book that I wrote? Absolutely had no idea. It was just when I sat down to write The Disappearance of Astrid Bricard, I suddenly realised Astrid needed a figure in her life who 
could give her some kind of maternal advice because she was kind of missing that mother figure and also someone who had some background in fashion um, to be able to guide her. And it's like, oh, well, I've got that person. That's Alex. And I, I had this kind of habit of having characters from previous books make cameos in the book that I'm currently writing. And so it felt like a perfect thing to do. Um, that little Easter egg that readers always comment if they've read my previous books oh I loved meeting this character again so so no I didn't really know um what I was going to do when I was writing Alex but it was so lovely to write her back into this book and I hope if you're a reader you enjoyed meeting her again very good thank you and we we are more interested in research so um if you'd like to tell us a little bit more about your research this is a specific question about what does a month of research look like to you and maybe after Natasha's finished Kate if you'd like to add something about your research as well so a month of research for this particular book involved a lot of translating Mitz's terrible handwriting in French in her letters that she'd written to various people so I found for example a cache of letters that she had written to Cecil Beaton the famous fashion photographer um, and I wanted to read all of those because it gave me a glimpse of Mitza as a person and her personal concerns and the kinds of things she felt were important enough to capture in letters to Cecil. So they had this correspondence that went on for years. Um, and again, this was another indication that there was a bit more to Mitza than being amused because why would Cecil waste his time with such an extended correspondence with Mitza? So it meant decoding her handwriting and then translating the French um, another stash of letters that she'd written to Princess Marta Vibesco, who was a Romanian princess, again, to give me uh, nitty gritty details about uh, Mitz's life as a human being. And then it meant doing some fun things like um, looking into what was happening during the 70s in terms of that youth quake, as Diana Vreeland coined it, what were some of the protests happening uh, finding photographs of the Women's March for Equality so I could write about that in the book, uh, researching just simple facts and dates like when did the Vietnam draft take place? So the men I was writing about in my book, how would the draft have affected them and what number would they have to have drawn to be able to still be around in Manhattan at that time rather than being sent to Vietnam? So sometimes it's deep stuff like Mitz's letters and sometimes it's just little facts to make sure that what you're writing was that can actually hold up to be authentically true in the time. So it's mostly reading, mostly trawling through archives. Uh, sometimes it's a wasted day where you follow a, a, an end and it turns out to be a dead one. And sometimes it's very rewarding when you find, you know, that stash of letters you weren't expecting. Um, how about you, Kate? How, how does your kind of research work? Yeah, very similar to you, Natasha, like a lot of um, trawling over archives um, and listening to sort of oral archives. But I also try wherever I possibly can to go out and interview what I suppose historians would call primary sources. But I just like to think of as an extraordinary wartime men and women. So I'll often, you know, for example, with the little wartime library, I found out about that through a conversation with a 92 year old East Ender called Pat who told me about this this incredible underground library that she used to go to at Bethnal Green Tube. And that's just, just a sort of throwaway comment in a conversation. And it, it leads you into this wonderful kind of rabbit hole of, of learning. So from that conversation, I followed a paper trail to an archive and discovered the photographs of this of this extraordinary underground library and all the other facilities that happened at, at Bethnal Green. And, and then really from there, it was like trying to find more people that I could speak to that could verify and tell me more information. So that could be posting in the local paper, going on radio, um, putting articles up on, on Facebook, anything to try and track down people that can give you that wealth of sort of an, an unfiltered gush of social history. So that's sort of my my happy place really is sitting perched on someone's sofa with a, a cup of tea, listening to that wonderful gush of history that you get. Um, so, and also I think we're at that time now, I'm really acutely aware that, that that kind of window of opportunity to listen to those firsthand sources will not be around in five years time. So wherever possible, I'm wearing out a lot of shoe leather dashing around the East End or my new book set in Jersey and interviewing as many people as I possibly can for historical records. So that's always first, but then I always back up with the, with the other sources and archives and so forth. But yeah, you never know. That's the wonderful thing about history, take, uh, about research. It takes you to surprising places. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Next question is, interesting that you mentioned Lee Miller's photographs. 
didn't she also get more recognition as Man Ray's muse than as a great photographer herself? Yes, she absolutely did. Um, you know, if you read about Lee, there are many books that will say she was Man Ray's muse, when in fact, you know, Lee was an integral part of Man Ray. Um, in fact, I'm going to rephrase that. Lee was a part of the discovery of solarization, which was a technique that Man Ray used in his photographs and that Lee also used in her photographs. People will say Man Ray discovered solarization. No, Lee Miller was a huge part of that discovery of solarization as a photographic technique. Um, and yes, she learned some photographic techniques from Man Ray and he did photograph her a lot, but I don't I think to call her simply his muse is again very reductive when she was an incredible photojournalist in her own right, an incredible wartime reporter. You know, she captured photographs of the nurses behind the scenes, the civilian women left behind in the rubble of bombed Germany. Um, she was so much more than a muse. Um, and it's, you know, fantastic that her, her son was able to find all of her documents that she'd hidden away and resurrect her and bring her back to everyone's attention sadly after her death it's interesting because I, I interviewed her son actually um I five years ago for Marie Claire magazine yeah, yeah. and he knew nothing about his mother's wartime past as far as he was concerned his mother was a sort of angry drunk and then yeah. after her death he went up into the loft and he began to look through these extraordinary photos and there was his mother sitting, you know, in Hitler's bathtub and, and all these unbelievable images. And suddenly he had to reframe the, everything that he knew about his mother. So I suppose in some ways it's slightly interesting that she was complicit in a way in, in kind of hiding her 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 true um, achievements. But, uh, but yeah, wow, what a fascinating woman. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, a, la a final question, and then we'll wrap up. How do you decide what overlooked strong women in history to write about, since there are so many? <laughs> um, I don't know if it's a logical, mental decision. I, I feel like in the writing process, there's a lot of gut instinct. And for some reason, it's a bit like what you were saying, Kate, about, you know, when you were talking to Pat and she happened to mention this underground library and suddenly that just sparks some chemical reaction in your novelist brain that goes, wow, that's a story in there, whereas she probably talked about lots of other things too. And maybe some of those other things that she talked about might spark that chemical reaction in a different novelist brain. Um, but so it's when I am reading something and that chemical reaction happens and I go, that is my next book. And I never know where I'm going to find that or what that's going to be. So I kind of make it a habit to listen to lots of podcasts, to read lots of books, to go to art exhibitions, to go to theatre, just to be in the world experiencing new and different things because when I do that, that's where I find my story ideas. Um, is it a bit the same like that for you, Kate? Oh, for definite. It, I, I can almost feel the moment that it happens. I like to call yes, it the history shivers. Exactly. But oh, when yes, I get that moment, right. <laughs> it's true. But whether I just read a plaque on a wall or I hear a line of a conversation, that is all it takes. And I know instantaneously that's going to be my next book. It really yeah. does happen like that for me. Oh, I'm going to borrow that. The history shivers. I love it. It's that a great so phrase, isn't it? I can literally feel it down the back of my neck and almost instantly I think, I don't know how I'm going to research this. I don't know where the story is going to go, but it is a story and it does need to be a book. <laughs> Well, we're going to wrap up. And as I say, thank you. We have one more comment from a, a listener. This is not a question, but I love that you, you use such descriptive language with adjectives and similes. I teach second grade <laughs> and I teach my seven-year-olds all about similes and they love it. So with that, oh. we thank you very much. <laughs> there you go, then, Natasha. <laughs> Kate Thompson. And um, for our listeners, remember you can purchase your copy of The Disappearance of Astrid Brickard and pre-order the Wartime Book Club. Thanks so much for joining RJ Julia, Wesley and RJ Julia and Book Hampton today. Thank you very much and all the best. Bye. Thank you for watching and thank you to RJ Julia for hosting us. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.